Good evening, everybody. It's always a little bit intimidating to speak, speak at your home church. <laughs> it really is, but I'm, I'm so glad to be here, whether it's one or 1,000, it doesn't matter to me. I just want to help equip you. Um, so we will be in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 1 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. If you do have your Bible, I want you to open it up. Do I need to do anything? It's done. All right. Testing one, two. All right. So I will try to do my best to be consistent with this microphone so I don't give the sound guys a nervous wreck back there. <laughs> so when Nate approached me about talking and sharing with this to on this topic, uh, I was automatically excited. Then he gave me the question, why should we share the gospel? And I... At the first glance, I probably had the same response maybe you had. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Why should we share the gospel? I mean, it should be instinctively obvious. And it's like us being humans, we see the need to put on clothes, eating meals, drinking when we're thirsty. It's just a part of being human. But when we think about this, spiritually, sharing the gospel should be a necessity, but, it, but if you're like me, uh, listen, I, just because I'm evangelist doesn't mean I get it right every time. So I, I had to go to the doctor the other day and, and get a, a shot to head out of the country, a typhoid shot. And she gave me the, the bill and I got sticker shock. <laughs> and I was so frustrated about how much I had to pay. I forgot to ask her, you know, do you, do you know the gospel? Have you ever... Um, processed who Jesus Christ is, just asking open-ended questions. So I missed that opportunity. So I don't get it right every time either. But we do need to see the importance of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason a lot of us don't share as much as we should is because some of us feel incompetent. We feel fear. We feel doubt. We worry about what people are going to think of us. And that's just the reality, right? I mean, if I sat down and had coffee with you guys and I'd ask you, what's the biggest fear that you have? They may vary, but all of them will stem from something to do with fear, what people think about you, uh, being incompetent, not wanting to rock the apple cart, whatever it may be, it would be something to do along those lines. So now we're, we're going to be in the book of Ephesus uh, Ephesians, excuse me, the church at, at Ephesus will be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Give you a brief background on this church. Uh, it was located in the entertaining facility of the world. I mean, they had arenas, and uh, I think Pastor Dwayne, either you and Nate preached or got to share at one of the arenas there in Ephesus. I mean, it would hold thousands of people. Uh, it also had I hate to say it, but sex at the middle of his worship, um, male prostitution. And I got to contemplating the, the background of this, of this city and what Paul was going into. This wasn't some tidy little Christian community <laughs> Paul was dealing with. He was dealing with a modern day America. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, look at our culture. It's so perverse. Sexuality, gender identity entertainment out of the wazoo. I mean, you, you can be entertained. Your eyes are bulging in football, soccer, baseball, uh, sexuality, whatever, whatever you choose, you, could, you can be entertained here in America. And it's just like Ephesus. But there are three major points, or actually four, four major points in this text that we're going to see here. Verses one through four, we're going to see humanity's story. Okay, verses five through six, we're going to see the glory of God. And you guys don't have to flip through these, these PowerPoints. You can just stay right there at the first one. Verses seven through nine, you're going to see the benefit of man from God's glory. And then in verse 10, we're going to see humanity's story, 
the glory of God and the benefit of man all in one verse. I want us to read the word of God and then we will get started. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that is now at the work in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of, the, of our flesh, indulging in the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And is raised up, we, and raised up, Raised, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. Now, this is the word of the Lord. So verses one through four, humanity's story. What Paul's doing in the first two verses here is reminding who we were. We're dead. So automatically, when you are... Thinking of witnessing to someone who may not know Christ or praying through witnessing to someone who does not know Christ, it should put you in a position of humility because you're no longer that way. Not that you're perfect, but you now understand what it truly means to be human. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on tonight. It should put you in a posture of humility. You now, by God's grace, you have control over your desires you're not perfect, but you know what it means to be like Christ. You know what it means to live for righteousness. But these other people, they're still dead. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air. And that's another aspect. Pastor DeWayne just touched on it. If you don't believe Satan is real, you're deceiving yourself. He's a defeated foe, don't get me wrong, but he's very real. There's a spiritual battle. Paul said it well in, in this book, a little bit later in a few chapters down the road, that we fight not against flesh and blood. I mean, I have been at times communicating the gospel with someone whose heart just seems to be wide open, and all of a sudden a friend begins to pull them away. I mean, physically pulled away or our truck comes by revving its engine as loud as it can go. So if, if you don't think there's spiritual warfare in what you're doing, then you're deceiving yourself. Now, the spirit that's at work in the sons of disobedient. In humanity's story, you must understand that these people, they are being disobedient to God. That's their very nature. They're in rebellion against him. Now, there's a way to communicate that, and there's a way to say things that you don't have to go up and say, you know, you're just disobedient. You need to, you need to stop. You need to turn around and, and quit being disobedient to God. There's a way to communicate things. There's a, a way to articulate this, but this is the reality that you must have in your mind. You must have a template in your head. You must have good sound theology before you go into these conversations, because when you get in conversations, I'm going to share the God of this age or the idea that's the God of this age when we get a little further into the text. But you must understand these people are spiritually dead and you were once dead, but you're now made alive. Verse three, among them, we too formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest of mankind. Now, if you want to understand what's going on in your culture, what's going on in the world, you need to understand this, this verse. All right, so that was us. We used to be controlled by lust and of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of our mind, and we're by nature children of wrath. 
This culture is being led by its mind. As Pastor Dwayne's taught us years and years ago, it starts in the mind and then it hits the body. If you want to understand why we have perversion flooding our nation, greed, violence filling the street. I was watching a video the other day, a, 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 a lady in the Bronx, she's so scared to come out of her house because gangs are running the streets and beating elderly people with wooden sticks. That's happening in America. Now, why is that going on? That's go I'm not, and I'm no political persuasion here. I don't care whether you're Democrat, Libertarian, or Republican. I really don't care. This stuff is happening. There's division. There's people coming into these convenience stores and these, these stores and just beating the doors down and taking what they want. Why? Because they're controlled by the lust of their flesh. They're controlled by their own fleshly desires. You have to understand this. What the mind is going to think, the body is going to follow. You know, you, you think about this, that although we don't have the temple of Di Diana that the church of Ephesians had, and Ephesus had, right? Diana was this goddess of fertility, right? That they, they bowed down and they worshiped her. This is what the temple prostitution was about. But yet we had the God of sex in this culture. Look at it, the LGBTQ community. We don't hate them, we love them. But they worship what? They worship and they find their identity either in their gender that they want to be or either in the sex that they want to follow after. So that's why these types of things are happening. There's no way around it. That's just the reality of what's taking place. Now, before we move on to the good news, I want to tell us and show us the four types of people to put your mind at ease, the four types of people that you're going to run into when you begin to witness to people. If you have your Bible, I want you to flip to Acts chapter 17 real quick, and I want to read to you verses 32 through 34. Now, I'd like to see some engagement here because we have a smaller crowd. I want to see some engagement, okay? I'm going to read this verse or these verses. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others says, we will, others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom was Dionysius, the Areopagite, the woman named Demetria, and the others who were with him. Now, I want to ask you a question, and if you don't know, then that's fine. How many people do we see in these, these verses? Think about it. There are three of them. But there is a fourth. Uh, on, in, in, a, in a passing way, there is a fourth. And I'm going to talk about those first. Now when they, the word they, there are countless people that are listening and hearing. Okay? The first group that you have to remember you may run into is the passive group. Maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's someone that you come out with us and you begin to engage as you're talking with them, and they're just passive. They could care less. They have no fear of God. They don't want to know about Jesus, and they, they, they just don't want to talk to you. You know, you can't force someone to talk to you. You can't force your coworker to talk with you. They're very just a passive person. Okay, that's the first group you run into. But then you'll run into the group that mock and scoff. Okay, if you don't have memorized Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12, I'm going to encourage you to memorize those verses because we are blessed when we were persecuted. Blessed are those who persecute you, for so they persecuted the prophets before you. We don't go out looking for persecution. We don't go out looking for mocking and scoffing. And when you do this in a one-on-one -on -one setting, it's not going to be like a, a big, big mocking, scoffing charade or parade. They're not going to expose you in front of the whole workplace or what it may be. But they're just going to laugh at you, kind of snicker under their breath. Like, you believe that silly stuff? You know, so that's, that's what you may face from time to time. But then the, the third group are those who want to know more. These are the people that you may meet at the coffee shop or you may meet, you have in your family or you have in your workplace or you, you, you meet and your burden to share with them. And they really, they may have their hands crossed, but they want to know more. They want to know more. 
These are the people that you need to spend time with. Remember, you can't deal with the passive person. They won't even talk to you. The scoffer and the mocker, he could turn into someone or she could turn into someone who wants to know more. But right now they're not. But those who want to know more, spend time with, answer their questions, go to the Bible. And if you don't have the answer, do this, do the salesman approach. I do this all the time. And I've had several follow up conversations. I don't have the answer to this right now, but you know what? Give me some time. I'd love to uh, have some coffee with you or lunch with you the next time. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about it. Or, hey, can you give me your cell phone number? Uh, after I've researched this and talked to my pastor a little more, uh, I can get back with you and we can spend some time together. But then finally, you have those who believe. Now, we don't know where they are. We, we don't, they don't have ease tattooed on their forehead. <laughs> they don't. This is why you have to share. You have to communicate. You have to share. You have to realize that these people are being led by their desires. They're being led by their minds and their bodies and their flesh. They're all wrapped up in the world. But you don't know those who are going to believe. That's why we must witness. I was out. Where's that? Myrtle Beach the other day, and I was doing some training, and we were witnessing out on the boardwalk. Andrew came up. I began to witness to him. Man, he put off excuse after excuse, and what I kept doing is responding to his excuse and moving it off to the side. He gave another excuse, responding to his excuse and moving it off to the side. And finally, it got to the point I said, so, so Andrew, we've addressed all your excuses. I said, you still are hesitant. He told me this. He said, Tommy, it's hard to admit that I need help. It's hard to come to the God who created me and so perfect and go, God, I need help. I said, listen, man. I said, you are talking to basically a complete stranger. I've known you for five minutes and you're admitting all the stuff to me. You're nervous to go before the God of all creation who already knows all things, who already gave you life and sustains your life. He said, that's a good point. <laughs> Sometimes just helping someone understand and clarifying things really does help. Now, God was at work a long time before I ever met Andrew. He had a godly grandmother, a godly father and mother that had poured into them. He just walked away. He just had never believed. And then his last ditch effort was, but Tommy, I've got purgatory. And I looked at Andrew and I said, Andrew, I said, that's a Catholic doctrine. That's not in the Bible. That come from the Apocrypha, not the Holy Scriptures. And then he looked at me, and we just got done talking about Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I just explained what the fear of the Lord was. He said, So you're telling me, Tommy, it's heaven or hell. I said, There you go. You got it. It's heaven or hell. He said, Tommy, I need Christ. I said, Andrew, you do. You need Christ. And he cried out to receive Christ that day, right there. He made a belief. He trusted in Christ. Now, I've been in his life. He, we're getting him plugged into a healthy church. He sent me a text. I sent Pastor Dwayne the text because I just wanted to encourage him. He, uh, I sent him a text two days later. He says, Tommy, I want you to know I'm, I've been reading the Bible only for two days, and it's opened my eyes to so much. You know, I share that story with you, not for you to look at me, because God could have done that with anybody. He could have done that with you. I just go out and share the gospel, <laughs> and finally, God brings me to somebody who really their heart is soft. But if we don't share the gospel, this is never going to happen on your watch, right? And I challenged Andrew to make sure he's bearing fruit, proving that he's repented and, and he believes the truth. So those are the four types of people. And before we get into verse four, I wanted to share those four types of people with you so you could begin to understand or acclimate your mind to the reality of these people who are led by their hearts and their desires. Now, if I could pinpoint, I'm trying to make this simple for you because I know your minds are reeling and you're, 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 you're being just, you're nervous because if you're like me, you are about sharing your faith. I want to make this easy for you. I gave you the four types of people, right? Those who are passive, those who are going to scoff and mock at you maybe, those who are going to want to know more and those who are going to want to believe. But I want to share with you the God of this age. And Pastor Dwayne touches on this almost every Sunday. I have a, a little curriculum that I wrote called the uh, Top Five Common Objections. It's I want to teach you how to fight, but we're only going to talk about one tonight. Uh, the face of evil. I don't believe in your God. God does not exist. Humans determine right from wrong. 
trustworthiness of the scriptures. That's the fight acronym. You need to learn how to fight. If you want, want, want that uh, curriculum, you can go to our website, gospelgm.com. But I want to share with you the big one, H, in the fight. Humans determine right from wrong. That is the God of this age. I was just on NC State on Thursday. I was preaching from uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 3 through 5. I was around, around Nahum uh, going into Israel and not wanting to dip down in the Jordan River. And I was explaining what it means to trust God rather than try to put God on our terms. And this young man from India comes by and I said, sir, I said, I asked a question. I said, do you want to obey God? Do you obey God? And he turned around really quick and stopped. And he says, I don't believe in God. So that doesn't affect me. Now, what is he affected by there? He's affected by what? He thinks his belief determines what is true. Now, I shared with him. I said, uh, young man, I said, do you realize that just because you believe something, it doesn't make it true? He was like, well, that's weird. That, that doesn't make any sense. I said, how do you know that something is true? Now, I'm, I know there are different categories of truth, right? I mean, you got truth where... Uh, I like a certain type of deodorant. You like a certain type of deodorant. I'm not talking about truth like that. I'm talking about objective truth. I said, how do you know if something is really is true? I said, God has revealed it to us. That's how we can know. It's called revelatory epistemology. It simply means it's a revealed knowledge that God has revealed this to us that we can know the truth. And he looked at me and he says, well, you, do you realize that people believe differently? I said, I'm not saying that people don't believe differently. I'll give you that, definitely. But if you're going to have objective truth that allows you to make sense out of life, it has to come from a God who's revealed himself to us. And God has clearly done that for us. And of course, he uh, says, well, I don't believe that. And he just, he just kind of walks off. And I don't have a happy ending there. I just, it, he just walks away. But we have to teach people, we have to understand that just because someone believes something, it doesn't determine it, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's true. Who determines truth is God's objective truth given to us through the Bible and creation. So that's the reality, that's the truth that we must understand. Now, getting to the good news, this is the biggest but in all of Scripture. Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, my friends, before someone's ever going to see their need for mercy, they're going to have to see themselves as broken. They're going to have to see their desires. They're going to have to see their mind. They're going to have to see that what they're doing with their bodies is not honorable to God. I would tell you, I've gone, I've shared with a few people in my time. I've gone to different places in the world and shared where are you going to be if you're going to be in America the majority of your time on this earth sharing and witnessing the people? This nation is devoid of the fear of God. They, they really are. They don't revere. They don't respect God. You know, they, they, don't, they think this book is just, just like a fairy tale. So you're going to have to go into their worldview and you're going to have to expose it for what it is. And I'm going to give some more on that before the night's up. I'm going to teach you what you need to know. K-N-O-W, right? I'm going to teach you what you need to know. That's another acronym. I'm, I, have a, I'm, I have a very simple mind, so if I can get an acronym wrapped in my little head, I can use that to witness and share with people. But my friends, when people begin to see that their bodies and their minds are broken and they have offended this God that's given them life, then they're going to begin to understand the mercies of God. They're going to begin to understand the great love in which he loved them. But let me tell you, if we don't share, how are they going to know? How are they going to see the importance? How are they going to see the urgency to come to believe? Now, this is a, a, should be a great comfort for you because you don't save anybody. We're not called to be fruitful. We're called to be faithful. God's the one that's fruitful. See, that's what I love about Pastor Dwayne and what, what, what he's doing here at Open Door 
It's not about gimmicks. I mean, he didn't have, with this event, he, he didn't have like um, pumping up a new, a new method of sharing your faith and, and get everybody pumped up with this new and had some fancy slides all over the place. He didn't have any of that because he knows the power of the word of God to save a soul. So you have to be able to communicate that they're broken, communicate they're sinful, and be able to communicate the beauty of God's mercy and God's grace. Now, in order for someone to understand the mercy and grace of God, they have to see that they're broken. And point two brings us to the glory of God. Now, as a Christian, this should make your heart leap for joy. That, as Pastor Milioni has been describing to us, the glory of God is God's weightiness. It's everything that God is. God's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's immutable. He's unchanging. He's infinite. He's unending. So this great God, when we begin to see verses 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive, made us alive together with Christ. That's you. There is a picture in the glory of God. When we begin to understand his mercies, we are understanding a facet of God's glory. When we understand God's justice, we're understanding a facet of his glory. We're understanding the weightiness of, of who we once were and now who we are. And we should let that motivate us to want to share with others. But I know what's happening to a lot of us. We're being conformed more to the world than we are transformed by the word of God. Let's just be honest. Our world is pushing on us. It's shoving on us. It's trying to make us more like them rather than like Christ. But the glory of God is seen here. We've seen that we once were dead. He's made us alive in him. It's in him. It's not in us. What's, as Pastor Milioni has been teaching us through Galatians. Works plus Doing works plus something equals salvation for all other beliefs. I word it like this. Every other religion says do. Dios, two, two letters, do. But Christianity words it in four letters, done. It's been done. And I don't care who you run into. I don't care whether it's the atheist or whether it's the agnostic or whether it's the Buddhist or whether it's the Hindu or whether it's the Hare Krishna or whether it's the Mormon or whether it's the Muslim all of them are working, trying to serve and satisfy their deity. They are on the hamster wheel of works. That should simplify it for you. As you begin to talk and ask questions to people, you're going to see this. That people really do think that they can be good enough to get to heaven. They're not saved. They don't, they've never had their transgressions forgiveness get forgiven. They still think they can work to earn salvation. Now, let me kind of talk with you briefly about these different pockets of beliefs. So, I know what you may be thinking. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe in the Bible. Mormons, they kind of believe in the Bible. Muslims kind of believe in the Bible. Well, they do, in a sense. But if you ask, talk to a Muslim, and I'll be sharing with, you know, when Pastor Dwayne and I travel over to the Middle East and, and Mozambique, I'll be talking more about this. Uh, the Muslim's God is not a just God. He's a capricious God. If you, do, if you do enough good, he may forgive you. Um, they really don't know. Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a false view of who God is. He's not a triune God. The Holy Spirit's some type of electrical force almost. Mormons, they have a false view of who the triune God is. That sums up Psalms 96 verse 5. He's the God who created the heavens. All the other gods are idols. That's a simple way to summarize that. You, know, you don't have to say it out the very front uh, in the beginning of your witnessing conversation, but you can share that. Listen, what you say you believe is not lining up with what God has given us. It's very easy to have these conversations if you just to push yourself to learn how to embrace the awkwardness. You know, for me, building relationships and witnessing to people is awkward. I know that sounds weird, doesn't it? But I feel comfortable right in the middle of just a thousand people who are yelling at me. 
I know that's odd. That's just the calls God's got on my life. But you guys challenge me to be relational. As I think I've said before, waste time for the gospel, right? And so many great conversations have opened up over the years with my neighbors with me just kind of wasting time and being there, right? But maybe I can challenge you a bit to embrace the awkwardness of the gospel conversation that God has for you. To pray, to intercede, to plead with God that he would give you an opportunity to witness, to share this good news about how that they're dead in their transgressions, but how they can be forgiven and saved through Christ. When's the last time you prayed that God would give you a gospel conversation? And I can promise you, if you do that, God is going to give it to you because he's a faithful God. He's a very faithful God. Man, if we just see this and we understand this, verse six, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. The position that we have in Christ, the authority that we have in Christ, not in an arrogant way, but when you sit and you talk to an unbeliever, do you know who that unbeliever is? That's an image bearer of a God that's denying their image of God. Remember, the one who has all authority has lined this conversation up. Push past your flesh and ask the questions. Some just key questions. I got these and I use these all the time. I, I, I'm just a buffet of different people. Ray Comfort, Dwayne Milioni, <laughs> um, Greg Kokel. I just... I borrow, I imitate Christ, right? I see the Christ in people, I just imitate them. Paul said that if you imitate Christ, as you see Christ in me, I'm, I just botched that up, but you know, you know what he says. He says, imitate Christ that you see in me. Just be an imitator. So here's some questions I use. So can I ask you, if I'm on a plane, what's your spiritual belief? That's a very open-ended question. Very open-ended question. What's your spiritual belief? And then, you know, what I learned from Greg Kokel, you can ask also, how did you come to that conclusion? Another question that can take you deeper is, what do you mean by that? That's a clarifying question. So what do you mean by the Holy Spirit is, is some um, force or Jesus died on the stake? So how did you come to that conclusion that Jesus died on the stake when you're talking to Jehovah's Witnesses? When you ask these questions, it opens people up to what they really do believe. It's like peeling back a layer of an onion. But you have to be willing to ask the question. You have to be willing to want this person to be seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You have to want them to be in Christ like you are in now in Christ. You want them to have a relationship with God because you realize that apart from God, all they have is hell and the justice and the wrath of God. That's what the scriptures tell us. If we believe that, we have to push past our comfort. We have to push past our fear and to begin to witness to them. I mean, look at what God has done in revealing himself and dwelling with his people. In the beginning, what? God dwelled with Adam and Eve. There was no sin and God dwelled with them. Sin came in. God built a, or had Israel build a mobile temple and he dwelt with them in that mobile temple as they marched through the desert. God had them build a permanent temple and he dwelled with them there. But now at the cross, God made a way for his mercies to birth forth, burst forth, and now he dwells in us, friends. So you have the God of all creation dwelling in you I have the God of all creation dwelling in me, and we're nervous and scared to talk to somebody made in God's image because of what they may think about us or what they may say. Man, we're silly, aren't we? That's just silly. That's just so silly. And telling the story of the cross, man begins to understand his real story. In telling the beauty about sin, about the reality of God being their creator, about Jesus coming to die for sin and being buried in the tomb and resurrected on the third day, 
defeating both death and hell. As Pastor Milioni said, work on your gospel presentations in 15 words or less. I, I, I have already crammed my 15 words. I, I really don't like it, but hey, you know, it is what it is. It's 15 words, right? <laughs> I'm looking forward more to the 50 word type, but I still have the 15 words down. You know, Augustine said this, the cross is the pulpit to which God preaches his love to the world. You get to share this good news. And I can tell you the Muslims don't have good news. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't have good news. The Mormons don't have good news. The atheists definitely don't have good news. We're just bags of protoplasm, meat machines made up of mostly water and a little bit of meat. There's no morality in their worldview. If they're honest, they'll tell you that. But, you know, we'll talk a little bit about them robbing from your worldview here soon. So in order for them to understand the glory of God, they have to understand, once again, that they're broken, they're sinful, they're led by their desires, their flesh. Once they begin to look at that, they begin to understand the mercy of God. They begin to be unveiled and understand who the glory of God is through the attribute of his mercy, through the attribute of his wrath. You have to understand the reality of hell, that their position has to change, that if they stand before God, they're going to be judged. Judged. There's no way around it. There's no way to avoid it. You know, when we look at what the resurrected Christ has done for us, he is the better Jonah. He is the better Lazarus. He is the better life. So we've understood what man's story is. Man is broken. He's rebellious. His mind is leading him to de desire his flesh more than anything else. He doesn't understand the glory of God, but when he understands the gospel, he begins to understand the glory of God. Let that sink in. The understanding the gospel allows people to understand more of who God is. Understanding the justice of God allows people to understand who God is. The benefit of man, verses 7 through 9. That's going to go from better to best here now. As I said, the aspect of God's glory is found in his mercy. And this is what it means to be truly human. Lost people are truly subhuman. They think that their fleshly desires are going to give them what truly makes or what makes true happiness. Think about it. You used to be that way. But now you know what true joy is. Now you know what true hope is. Now you know what true happiness is is so that in the ages to come he might show his surpasses riches surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus it's the second time it said in Christ Jesus now I have the NASB translation in the ages to come so Paul was writing this letter many years ago but we're still receiving in this age the riches of God's mercy and grace. And it's our passing riches. There's, it's bottomless. You can't get to the bottom of God's grace. You can't get to the bottom of God's mercy. You can't get to the bottom of God's kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He has all authority. He has supreme position over all things. This was God's plan from the beginning. See it in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. This was his plan, eternal plan. And he gives us his son. We have these riches in him, his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And we see in verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not as yourself, it's a gift of God, not as a result of work so that no man, no man may boast, no person may boast. For you have been saved by grace through faith. Now, I know you heard that verse a thousand times. You've been saved by grace through faith. It's not by works, so no man shall boast. That puts every other religion out of the picture. 
That gives you now only one God to believe in. Not all the lowercase g gods. You have to believe in the uppercase g God. You believe in him. You place your faith in him. You trust in him. You believe in him. That's what people have to get to that point. But they have to see they're broken. And I know, listen, when you begin talking about sin, I was thinking about this reality. I was driving through my neighborhood one day and I'm just thinking about all the different things that go on in my neighborhood. I mean, we saw sheriff's deputies in our neighborhood countless times. Um, domestic abuse, uh, violence. Um, and I know your neighborhood, you've probably seen it too. Do you know how broken your neighborhood is? I know we got manicured lawns, beautiful homes, people walking their dogs, but these people are broken. You've got to take the time to get into their life. You've got to take the time to ask the questions. You've got to take the time to make the gospel a priority. And when I have my finger pointed at you, I've got three pointed right back at me. I've got neighbors. I'm going to have neighbors where we're moving. They have struggles. They have uh, different things that they wrestle with. But you have to get in these people's lives so you can show them the surpassing riches of God's grace and his kindness towards us. You can lead them to faith. And I can tell you, as I said, I, I gave to you tonight, the God of this age is, you know, I don't believe that, Tommy. I, you know, Will Jackson, he works for the ministry and, you know, the young man is just passionate for the Lord. He went to the baseball game at Ridley Field, I think this is in Chicago with his father. And he sent me a text. He said, Mr. Tommy, pray for me. He said, I was witnessing to the guy to my right. And he said, don't preach to me, boy. Now, what, what type in that category in Acts chapter 17, what category would that guy fall in? I mean, that's kind of all scoffing and kind of mocking. Will wasn't preaching to him. I mean, he wasn't like he was standing up on the seat and going, thus says the Lord. <laughs> he wasn't preaching. He was having a conversation with him. But the guy, I've been in Chicago. Uh, we planted churches in Chicago, and I preached there many, many times on Michigan Ave. I had drug deals going right below my feet. They tried to get up under the preacher and do drug deals so <laughs> that uh, the police wouldn't look at them, right? And I know the mindset there. They're very hard people uh, in the sense of believing the gospel and trusting in Christ. So it doesn't surprise me at all. But he witnessed, and he shared, and he was just so distraught by it. He's like, oh, I just... I should have done more. I should have done more. I was like, no, you did exactly what God wanted you to do. You did exactly what God wanted you to do. Do you realize that when you witness to somebody, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do? And you'll, I know some of you will try, you'll try to beat yourself up. Well, I didn't do enough. I didn't say this. I didn't say, this. stop, stop. What all that negative conversation in your head? You witnessed. You shared something with them. You did more than the average person would do. Don't quit beating yourself up. Rejoice that you had that opportunity. Rejoice that window opened and you were able to witness. Pray for that next contact. Pray for that next time that you get to share with them. No one can boast about this gospel. I've already talked about every other religion is due. Christianity has already been done. Now let's look at verse 10. Verse 10 is... It gives us humanity's story, the benefit of man, and the glory of God. So it kind of wraps everything all up in one package, in one verse. Okay. Verse 10 here. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So humanity's story. For we're God's workmanship. I know within this, this context, it's talking about believers more per se. But we are God's workmanship. And everyone who doesn't know Christ is made in God's image. They're image bearer, whether, whether they're an infant or whether they are in the womb or whether they're 95 years old laying on their deathbed, deathbed taking their last breath. This is humanity's story. They are God's image bearers. They are God's workmanship, if you're believers. This is our story. All we are are clay vessels with good news and broken pots, right? That's all we are. The second point we see here in this verse, the benefit of man, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is an honor. This is our benefit. 
that everything that you do, whether you're at your workplace or whether you're with family, you're like, oh, my wife wants to, I got to go down and visit family in South Carolina. And I love my family, don't get me wrong, but they want to do like this uh, Walsh Family Olympics. And it's just exhausting. You know, you got these young kids and they always beat you because you're 45 years old and you can't run as fast as you used to. So it's just not really fair. They should give us like a handicap, right? But, he, <laughs> but anyway, so I have to go down there, but I, I'm going to love my family. Uh, this is what God wants me to do. It's good works that he has planned for me. And I'm going to look for opportunities to share the gospel with my, my nieces and my nephew and my, my uh, other people that I'm around. It's our benefit that we have these good works to do, right? But then look at this. The end of verse 10, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's the glory of God, that God planned this before you were even on earth. I mean, just ponder that just for a bit. You can just rest in that, that you are God's workmanship, you're in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he wants you to do. This is a good thing for you to share and witness. It's good that you do this. It's, it's like if you get scoffed and mocked, what does Matthew 5.11 tell us? You can rejoice. It's okay. They're not going to kill you. You're in America. They're not going to kill you. They may disagree with you. But if it's done well, you can do it for the glory of God. So there it is, the glory of God, the, the benefit of man in humanity's story. I want to share with you really quick how we can begin to apply some of this stuff that I've been talking about. Let's see here. I skipped my page here. There we are. Perfect. There it is. Excuse me. All right, so let's think through how we should witness. Got a little bit more time here. People have to see that who God is. They have to begin to fear the Lord. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They have to fear him. People have to see themselves for who they are. They're sinful, okay? And there are varying degrees of rejection, right? We saw this in Acts 17. Some are going to be passive, some are going to scoff and mock. Some are going to fold their hands. But then some are want to know more and some will believe. We're supposed to watch our life and our doctrine and hold sound doctrine very closely. So people have to see who God is and they have to see who they are. They're sinful. How are you going to communicate that? Use the word of God. Let the word of God you do that for you. Take him to the commandments. Then they have to, they, when they see who God is and his justice and his wrath and his mercy and his grace, they see they're sinful, then they'll begin to understand their need for the gospel. They'll begin to understand that they need this mercy, they need this grace. And then finally, the fourth point, they'll see their need to respond. Now, if you have that wrapped up in your head and you know that you need to communicate those four major sound doctrine points, uh, we don't have Greg Cole, uh, not Greg Cole, but uh, Greg Gilbert's book back there, What is the Gospel? That's a phenomenal book also. I haven't read this other book yet, uh, Share Jesus Without Freaking Out. I'm sure it's a great book. But the NO acronym, what you need to know when you get into a conversation, all right, so... Let's go through it. K-N-O-W, and I'll do this in about two or three minutes. Knowledge claims. So if they begin making knowledge claims, you have to ask him, ask them, so where did you get this knowledge claim from? Or where does it come from within your worldview? Because this is what happens time and time again. And the first person that ever turned me on to this was J.P. Moreland. He came to Southeastern in... I'm old. <laughs> so I graduated in 2012. It's probably about 2009. And he said, you know what irritates me the most about Christians? Had, had uh, Dr. Carson in the back going, amen. He's like, how does that guy always stay one step ahead of me? If you know Dr. Carson, he, he was a treat to have. I had him for a professor. But anyway, so he's there and he said, you know what irritates me the most about Christians? He says that they give up their worldview so easily. And they don't call people to account. So let me challenge you with what that means. So let's say we had two houses up here. One house was the person's worldview. The other house was our Christian worldview. 
What I see in conversations time and time again, the atheist, he'll begin to claim morality, right? Uh, what took place in the Texas elementary school? I'll ask, I said, do you think that's right or wrong? Of course, that's completely wrong. I agree that's wrong. He'll mosey on over to your worldview house. He'll take the jar of morality and go over to his worldview and put it in, in his worldview. Now, his worldview cannot, cannot account for morality if he's consistent within his worldview. That's why you have to ask them, where do you get morality from within your worldview? You're making this knowledge claim. Where does it come from from within your worldview? And that brings us to the N in the NO acronym, what you need to know. Just simply tell them. Now, we can account for that in the Christian worldview, but you can't rob from me anymore. I, I've done it kind of jokingly. I was like, listen, man, I'm not going to have to call the police, am I? <laughs> You're robbing from me again. Why are you robbing from me? And you can do this very kindly because 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to do this. Sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Always be ready to give a defense for our faith that we have, the joy that we hope we have within us, but do it with gentleness and reverence. Okay, so just kindly tell them, listen, we can account for this in the Christian worldview, but we can't from within yours. And that leads us to, oh, open up their worldview. Open it up. How do you, and so I had this happen to me all the time. They'll claim that, that uh, morals are subjective, right? That they're made by individual people or societies. And then I'll, I'll, give them a, 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 I'll give them an objective situation, like the Texas shooting in the elementary school. Is it wrong for that to take place? And they'll wholeheartedly say, yes, it is. And then I'll ask this. How do you reconcile what you say you believe with what you just agreed to? How do you reconcile what you say you believe with what you just agreed to? And then give them time to process that. Because you know what that, that's going to do? That's going to, their next response is going to show you whether they're ready to hear the gospel. Whether they're ready to, for you to use the W, weave it back to the gospel. If not, if they're trying to justify themselves. Just hold their feet lovingly with gentleness to the fire. Hey, listen, man, both, and I, both you and I know that that was wrong. And when you admit that it's wrong, you know what you're doing? You're acting like a Christian. Why are you acting like a Christian? Really become one. You know what that's doing? You're pushing them. You're finding common ground and you're leading them to repentance. Hey, let me share a few more things with you. Have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah, I have. Have you ever taken God's name in vain? What you're doing, you're just exposing them to their sins. You're exposing them to their brokenness. You're exposing them and using current day illustrations helps them see their society for what it really is from within a objective standard. Because the nation's lost its mind. Down is up, up is down, right is left. Uh, yeah, right is left, left is right. They don't know what they believe anymore. They're just like an anchor has been uprooted from the sea and they're just tossed to and fro. But here you're not. So that's the NO acronym. K-N-O-W. Knowledge claims where do you get these from within, from within your worldview? In, not in my worldview, lovingly do that, but say, listen, I can account for that here. But how do you account for it within yours? Open up their worldview. Expose them to what their worldview really leads them to. Insanity, absurdity, absurdity, and arbitrariness and inconsistencies are all over the place. Romans chapter 1, right? Professing to be wise, they become foolish. And then weave it back to the gospel. What I don't want you to do is to hear this and, and take uh, from this time that you're going to go out there and you're just going to win arguments. Because it's not about winning arguments. It's about winning souls to Christ, okay? That's why we have to be kind and gentle. We have to be able to be gentle with these people because what happens when you begin poking holes in these worldviews, it takes time for people to process that. But then their hearts become open to the gospel and you can see them radically transformed. Now, if you're here and you don't, maybe you don't know if you believe in Christ. Let me challenge you with something. I want you to know that God is your creator. He sustains you. He gives you life. I want you to know that we are all sinful. I was in the same boat that you were once that you're in. I'm not better than you. I'm, I'm not better than you. I'm better off because I believe in Christ. You're sinful. You need Christ. 
You've broken his laws. You've broken his good laws. And what does law do? The law shows us two amazing things. It does so much more, but it shows, does at least two. It shows us how good God is, but how bad we are. It allows us to get honest with who we really are. Have you, have you ever lied? Just be honest with yourself. Have you ever taken God's name in vain? Those are just two of God's amazing Ten Commandments to show us that we're guilty. The gospel is Christ has come to die for those sins. He's come to give us grace and mercy. You need to trust in Christ. You need to believe in him. You need to repent and trust in him. Respond to him today. Receive him. Receive his kindness and mercy. So you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be under God's wrath. You can come to his kindness and his gentleness and his love. Brothers and sisters, I... Thank you for this time. I'm, I hope you have more questions. I would, I would love to answer them. And if I don't have an answer for them, I'm just going to give you the Pastor Dwayne. <laughs> but uh, thank you for your time. Let me, let me pray for you, okay? Lord, thank you for this time. I pray that Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 would have helped my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that they would see that they have nothing to fear. Father, that humanity's story is just that. It's a story of brokenness. It's a story of being led by our minds and our bodies being led by our flesh. Uh, Lord, also, you, we see the glory of God in your gospel. We can peer into another, another aspect of your glory by understanding your mercy and your truth. And Father, the glory of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ benefits man so. so. I pray that uh, we would understand that and that would motivate us to go out and to share the good news of Christ. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Let them know that they're not by themselves. Let them push fast the nervousness and the fear. And as Nate probably going to talk about tomorrow, Lord, let, let them understand how to overcome their fears. I uh, pray for all the other speakers that are going to be doing the breakout sessions and our panel discussion tomorrow uh, before we leave. I pray this would be a benefit to Open Door Church. And as Pastor Milioni said, there would be many testimonies of people just being faithful to witness that they would take the gospel seed and they would spread it far and wide. Father, if they don't spread the gospel seed, nothing will ever grow. But if they spread it, it will begin to grow. Thank you, Daddy, for loving us. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Holy Spirit, thank you for dwelling in us. Thank you for your mercy, your kindness upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.